share your yes. screen. I was like sharing the screen. As a transition, so I mean, part will tell you, but this is really an effort to um, help the community um, better evaluate uh, these uh, recent algorithms on predicting human trajectory forecasting. Part, the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Yes. So, hello everyone. So today I will be talking about the TrashNet++ benchmark or the challenge, which is the part of the third workshop on long-term human prediction. And actually this challenge was also in its initial stages was also part of the second workshop. So this is our second year running this challenge for this workshop. So that's great. So I'll jump right into TrashNet++, which is basically a challenge for human trajectory forecasting. Now, as you have seen in this workshop that human trajectory forecasting has is evolving as a very important field in recent years, mainly because of its variety of applications from self-driving cars to having autonomous robots, which react with a lot of humans to using it in advanced surveillance and also help us building a smart infrastructure. So, uh, for completeness, we define human trajectory forecasting as we are given the past trajectories of all the pedestrians which are present in the scene. And we want to predict the future trajectories which conform to the social norms, like yielding right of way or respecting personal space. So this field brings with itself the challenges of sequence prediction, that since it's, we are predicting the sequence, we need to model the sequence prediction aspect of this problem statement. Next, we have to take care is the social interactions. We need to reason with the humans in our surrounding and then decide our future. So we need to take the social interactions into account. And third, given a past scene, many futures are possible. And this is termed as multimodality. So this is another aspect which needs to be tackled by works. So given a human trajectory forecasting model, let's say you have tackled each of these challenges or some of these challenges. The next crucial part is to evaluate these methods. And that is where TrashNet++ comes into the picture. As to why do we need TrashNet++ where other human trajectory data sets already exist. So within other human trajectory data sets, the current works usually evaluate on the standard data sets of uh, BV and UCY. However, if you compare different methods of a simple vanilla LSTM, which is a standard baseline for these works, you see a high variance in the baseline results across various works for the same standard baseline. Now this arises because all the works have different data processing strategies. So they select different subset of data based on their data processing. And second, they have different trajectory sampling strategies. Like do these works sample all the trajectories or do these sample static trajectories which do not give much information about their proposed forecasting model. So this is one of the drawback. And second, that does it exist a uniform benchmark, which gives a uniform as well as an extensive evaluation of all the metrics which need to be taken care of when we are evaluating a trajectory forecasting model. So these two major points inspired us for a need of a trajectory based benchmark. And therefore we present to you TrashNet++ in this workshop. So TrashNet, work, uh, TrashNet challenge first has a defined trajectory categorization. And this defined categorization helps us to sample interaction centric trajectories. Or in other words, we largely sample trajectories where social interactions occur and less of those trajectories which are static and linear and do not provide much information regarding our forecasting model. And second, we present an extensive evaluation uh, which evaluates not only methods which predict just one future, but also methods which can predict multiple futures. With respect to trajectory categorization, this is our overall uh, categorization framework where given a trajectory, we first identify is it static. Uh, then we identify is it linear. By linear, we mean can it be, can the trajectory be predicted by a simple Kalman filter? So that goes into our category two. And within the non-linear categories, we have the interacting categories where the traject where uh, in these samples the trajectories undergo various social interactions known in literature like leader follower collision avoidance or group behavior or they can be non-linear trajectories which can arise not because of social interactions but because of the pedestrians internal goals which are not 
observable to us and we don't have access to. And for evaluation, we have an extensive evaluation framework comprising of a wide range of unimodal metrics. I'll talk about it in the next slide, as well as multimodal metrics. So if somebody is outputting a distribution, our transnet evaluation can also provide you a multimodal evaluation for the same. So I'll quickly go over the evaluation metrics, which we have. So the uh, let's call the uh, trajectory we are in evaluating as the primary trajectory. Then the ground truth of this trajectory is shown in blue. Uh, the prediction given out by the model is shown in green. And let's say X2 is the neighbor of X1 and its future is shown in red. So there are two standards evaluation metrics. One is the average displacement error and another is the final displacement error, which are largely used in this field. And final displacement error for interacting trajectories is the metric which we use to evaluate the different methods. However, ac outputting accurate trajectories is an important aspect for a forecasting model. But another important aspect with regards to human trajectory forecasting is to output safe trajectories or trajectories which conform to social norms. And for those reasons, in Trasnet Plus Plus, we have the novel evaluation metric of introducing collisions. So one collision metric which can occur is the ground truth collision. That is the percentage of collisions which occur between the prediction of the primary pedestrian and the neighbors. As you can see here, there is no ground truth collision. However, there is a case where a ground truth collision can occur. But we realize that a metric which is more important than the ground truth collision is actually the prediction collision. By that we mean, has the model understood the concept of collision avoidance? So as you can see here that the primary prediction is colliding in the ground truth. But if you look at the model prediction of the neighbor, there is actually no collision between the different pedestrians. And this is an important metric to consider. And you will see in today's presentations by various methods, two of the methods actually focus on the collision avoidance property of trajectory forecasting, along with outputting accurate predictions. And for Trasnet++, we use various real-world data sets that are available. However, as pointed earlier, we sample these data sets and evaluate on those trajectories in which social interactions occur. So we use the ETS data set, UCY data set, wild track data set, and the uh, SBB CFF data set uh, of Switzerland, and the recently released LCAS data set. And so we don't just limit ourselves to putting out the benchmark out there, but we also want to garner interest of people in trajectory forecasting. And one way in which we are fostering this interest is to provide already already available baselines to you directly. So if you can go, if you go to a Trashnet++ repository, we open source codes of all classical methods like social force and orca, and also the latest data-driven methods like social LSTM, social GAN, conditional or variational autoencoder. So if somebody is new to this field, he can directly get kickstarted into uh, for doing trajectory forecasting using our repository. And uh, someone for greater details regarding Trashnet++ can also read our recently accepted uh, ITS paper, accepted to intelligent, in, intelligent transportation systems transactions. And uh, the Trashnet is uh, the Trashnet challenge is still open beyond this workshop. So feel free to keep on uh, submitting your models to this challenge and increasing the uh, increasing the accuracy of human trajectory forecasting models. And uh, so we haven't stopped, stopped at the Trasnet forecasting. And these are some statistics of the challenge over the last one year. So since one last year, like since the last uh, ICRA uh, workshop, our challenges received great attention. We have more than 15,000 people visiting our challenge, more than 200 participants who in total have created more than 1,000 submissions. So this is actually one place where everyone is evaluating trajectory forecasting model in an objective social interaction centric framework. So please do consider uh, submitting to the challenge. And, uh, and we have gone beyond, we have expanded on the Trasnet++ framework. We have expanded on giving our accuracy prediction and col uh, collision centric, less collision based, socially compliant predictions. 
and now we want to take a step further and see that can we also have interpretable predictions where the model can explain its model decisions with respect to the with respect to the decision outputted by it and this new work has been recently accepted to cvpr 2021 and this work basically views human trajectory forecasting in a slightly different perspective where we view human trajectory forecasting as a sequence as predicting a sequence of choices made by this persons and these choices are based on interpretable social concepts like leader follower collision avoidance and these choices decides where i want to put the next step and this perspective brings the discrete choice modeling framework into the data driven framework and this is what we show in this paper here i'll just show a toy example so uh, given the pedestrian on the left which is our primary pedestrian uh, these are the 15 choices he has in front of him at each time step and if no neighbors are present a uh, pedestrian prefers to maintain the same speed and same direction now due to social concept of leader follower some of the cells become more active have a higher probability of getting accepted and to prevent collision avoidance the probability of some of the cells go lower and given this new probabilities we uh, we predict different anchors these different anchors are called our social anchors and also as you can see the output of these of this method is discrete and so on top of that we add a neural network based refinement and combining this together we get a final predicted future sequence and as you can see in this method that the high level decisions are based on interpretable social concepts while the neural networks jump in to increase the accuracy of our predictions. So this is how we are building on top of the Trashnet++ framework. And uh, now uh, we are lucky to have the top three methods who will be presenting their presentations on how did they achieve the top three rank on the Trashnet++ leaderboard. So first we will start with Joseph and his team who are from the Mainz Paris Tech University and I will give the stage to them without taking much of your time. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Bart. Joseph, feel free to share your... Uh, you, should be, you should be able to see my screen now. Now yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Joseph Gestoin. I'm a second year PhD student at the Center for Robotics of Min Paris Tech. And I also work as a research scientist for the Vedecom Institute. And I was part of the team that ranked second on the Trajnet++ dataset uh, with the help of my teammates, uh, Raphael Rosenberg, who is a former intern at the Centre de Robotique and who is from l'Ecole Normale Supérieure, and my PhD advisor, Fabien Mouta. Um, today, I'm going to present you our work. So you were enhanced asymmetrical by a enhanced to encode pedestrian trajectories. And we mainly aimed at um, investigating the relevance of a new sequence encoder um, that could be seen as an alternative for recurrent neural network to encode pedestrian trajectories. Uh, so let's start really quickly. Um, the typical pipeline to predict the future coordinates of pedestrian is usually like this. Uh, you have two parts, uh, an encoding part and a decoding part. And um, in the encoding part, there are two encoders that work together, the sequence encoder on which we worked, and this one encodes the past trajectories individually, and the interaction encoder, which job is to make sense of interaction between pedestrians. And both encoders are used by the decoder, uh, which predict, predicts trajectories. Um, a majority of approaches have been proposed and they specifically uh, focused on the interaction encoder. And in our work, uh, we eluded the question of improving social um, interaction mechanism but we focused on proposing a new sequence encoder for the, over, for the overall pipeline. Um, some works on pedestrian trajectory forecasting, uh, they propose to use uh, by RNNs instead of regular LSTMs or RNNs uh, because they address a drawback of um, RNNs, uh, which is that they cannot really take the future into account. And for example, in trajectory forecasting, some movements are made because pedestrians uh, anticipate a potential obstacle, and uh, bidirectional LSTMs are aiming to capture that. Um, our encoder ar architecture, the URNN, is an asymmetrical alternative to the popular bidirectional RNN. So if we uh, take a look at, at uh, the bidirectional RNN on the left part of the figure, 
uh, you have two RNN, one that reads the input forward and one that reads the input backward. And then you just concatenate uh, both outputs. And in reality, this works very well, uh, but we can notice two things that are not necessarily desirable for trajectory forecasting. Uh, the first one is that the architecture is symmetrical in both time direction. And that is completely normal uh, because bidirectional RNNs were proposed for NLP. And in NLP, the order of the words is almost exclusively um, determined by grammatical rules and not by temporal sequentiality. Uh, however, in, in uh, trajectory forecasting, uh, using bidirectional RNNs doesn't really respect the preferred direction of the data, um, which is the forward one. The um, second drawback of by RNN is that the output is simply the concatenation of two naive readings uh, of the output in both time directions. So the bidirectional RNN never actually reads an input uh, by knowing what happens in the future. So the idea behind our approach, the URNN on the right side of the figure, is um, to use during the forward pass information about the future that was acquired during the backward pass. Um, on the figure, this is represented by the green arrows. And actually, it allows us to accumulate information while knowing which part of the information will be useful in the future, and this with respect to the preferred direction of the data. Um, of course, there were other approaches that have worked on the sequence encoder, uh, such as the transformer or uh, one-dimensional convolution, but um, they did not really and could not take into account the interaction mechanism, uh, which is obviously essential for trajectory production, uh, prediction. And in our case, we only worked on a portion of the pipeline and uh, we kept all the information uh, brought by the interaction encoder. Um, at the end of the day, it makes it an easy approach to deploy uh, while taking into account the previous works on interactions. Okay, so um, our goal was not really to reach the leaderboard top position, but more allow meaningful comparison between different sequence encoder uh, for various architectures. And we evaluated our asymmetrical by RNN approach for every available interaction baseline. So occupancy pooling, directional pooling, and social pooling. And for a variety of recurrent neural networks such as LSTMs and GRUs. Um, we firstly tried different combination of the encoder with directional pooling uh, because it was much faster to train than social pooling. Uh, and with only a small decrease in performance. Um, however, um, the architecture of the encoder did not seem at first to have an impact at all. Our UGRU uh, was no better than a simple GRU. Um, however, when we replaced UGRUs by ULSTM, uh, we got significantly better uh, final displacement error and call one. And um, it suggests that there was indeed information to make use of in the past trajectories of all the pedestrians. It also suggests uh, that the boost we got may come from uh, using information with long-term dependencies. And it confirms that some pedestrian movements are influenced by long-term long anticipations. And it also validated our asymmetrical by RNN approach as a second encoder in the process. Uh, just in case, we implemented a control architecture, which is the reversed ULSTM or reversed UGRU, uh, where the backward and the forward paths are inverted in the URNN. And it was done in order to in investigate if there was indeed a preferred direction of URNN according to the data, or um, if the results we got were simply just due to luck. And um, since we found a reliable sequence encoder, uh, that work better than regular um, LSTMs and by LSTMs uh, for the directional pooling method. We also tried uh, for occupancy and social pooling. And in both cases, um, our sequence encoder leads to better results compared to regular LSTMs by a nice margin. And uh, it led us to the second place uh, of the Trajanet++ benchmark. Um, in conclusion, uh, the Trajanet++ challenge has been really useful for us because it validated the usefulness of uh, using our asymmetrical by RNNs as a sequence encoder compared to uh, regular LSTMs or by LSTMs. And it also shows that there is still room for improvements in sequence encoding 
and that interactions are not the only aspect on which pedestrian trajectory prediction can progress. And finally, uh, we believe that the approach that we developed here uh, can be easily implemented and could be an interesting baseline to try, to try um, because it could significantly improve other pedestrian trajectory prediction algorithms. Uh, so you can find the, the code and everything uh, here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, maybe if I can uh, uh, quickly uh, ask questions. I don't know, um, part if you have time for questions. Yes, I think you can ask a question. Awesome. Uh, 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 thank you, Joseph, for this fantastic work. I mean, I guess my uh, first naive question is, uh, has this been uh, published uh, somewhere? Or have you submitted this line of work? No, we haven't, uh, actually. We we're talking about it right now. And we were not expecting the Trajnet++ plus plus, uh, benchmark to be on ICRA workshop. So we are not um, prepared at all to publish or anything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, uh, you should. Be, I think this, you have a, a great uh, insights. And thank you so much for all this, uh, this work. Um, do you, um, my second question is, um, do you have any advice on how we can improve? Uh, the Trajan++, plus plus, uh, anything from uh, the data, the... Um, what, I, uh, what I had in mind is my, my, my first concern was um, the exact hyperparameter settings and the amount of data we, you, you guys uh, use to train your baselines. And actually, when you see my results, I couldn't really compare myself to uh, what's in the paper because I didn't have the exact um, same hyperparameters, so uh, we had to run everything uh, from the start. But this is actually a really great baseline. And every time I had to ask something to parse, he, he, he replied to me really quickly. So I'm really happy with Trajanet++, actually. Thank you very much. So, so but do you think that we should also uh, better share our hyperparameters in the library uh, so that, I mean, this is a... Uh... Uh, and maybe training data as well. I think the most complicated part is uh, the training data because the train models. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And do you think we should add any? Uh, I don't know uh, more uh, evaluation metric or uh, um... uh, the the multimodal evaluation um, metrics should be should be used more often. Uh, I think it was a great idea to use the call one metric as a secondary secondary metric uh, for the competition because this is really uh, interesting to see. And for example, in our case, the gains in call one compared to the regular encoder are um, are uh, are really great. And I think uh, such metrics are really useful. And yeah. And the multimodal as well. Indeed, when I uh, invite one, uh, I see two bold. Um, I see it's the only interaction that is making your collision avoidance to 5.2. I see. Um, yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't know if there are questions from the crowd. Uh, I think in the interest of time, maybe the crowd can ask the questions on the chat. And uh, so anyways, thank you, Joseph. It was very in insightful. There were a lot of ablations which will really help people. And now we will move on to another uh, submission, which is top rank on the uh, AI crowd challenge. And it comes from the VitaLab EPFL itself. So you join you, the stage is yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Thank you. My oh. Oh, just one second. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yue Jiang Liu from EPFL. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, describe the key idea of our submission, which we call it uh, Social NCE. Uh, so, it's a joint work with my teammate Yan Qi and my PhD advisor, Professor Alexandra Alahi. All right, uh, so our method currently uh, ranked the first place on the TrashNet++ plus plus, uh, plus plus benchmark. Um, the key idea of our solution is uh, social NCE, uh, uh, learning method we de developed recently, applied on top of social LSEM model. So it actually achieved uh, the lowest uh, collision, uh, collision rates as well as the best uh, predicting accuracy. Uh, so our method is not specific to uh, human motion forecasting, it, it can actually be applied to many um, sequential prediction problems in the multi-agent context. 
So I will first describe the key idea and then uh, talk about how it can be applied in the motion forecasting problem. Okay, so uh, generally uh, uh, the sequential prediction problem in the multi-agent context can be uh, um, can, can be uh, considered as the like the following. So the model uh, take in, uh, take a sequence of observations of multiple agents in the scene as input, and the task is to predict uh, a sequence of actions about the future. And uh, this uh, sequential prediction problem encapsulates multiple real, real world applications. For example, we can forecast uh, the motion of pedestrians, motion of uh, vehicles, or uh, plan the trajectories for robot navigation or self-driving vehicles. And uh, one major challenge for those uh, problems is the is usually about how to model the complex dynamics inter interactions between multiple agents in the scene. Uh, in recent years, uh, people have proposed uh, a variety of powerful neural network models, uh, such as uh, RN transformer for sequential modeling, as well as the one <laughs> we just heard about. And uh, on the interaction modeling side, we also have those techniques like uh, pooling mechanism, attention mechanism, graph neural network, and so on. Uh, usually those models uh, uh, work pretty well on the holdout test that, but uh, they may not generalize well enough in the closed loop operation, especially when our training data is, is limited in the sense of dangerous events. So what do I mean by that? For example, if we consider this uh, human motion forecasting problem, usually it's a collected data set only contain observations from normal scenario without any dangerous events. So basically, if you look at the state space, all the training data uh, may stay on the safe side where uh, human, human players uh, never get close to uh, uh, collide with each other or even uh, get close to each other face to face. But at test time, uh, uh, our, in a closed loop operation, uh, the prediction error may accumulate over time. And at some point, maybe the model had uh, received an input over here, and then it has to tell something meaningful. Uh, to avoid collision and drive back to the safe uh, scenario, and which is very hard uh, for the current technique. If we consider um, the classical uh, maximum likelihood principle, what we usually do is to try to uh, teach the model to push up, uh, push up the probability of the observed sample. But the learned model may have little idea about how it should do uh, in this uh, dangerous regime or those unseen regime. So how can we address this issue? Uh, in our work, we propose uh, a method called social NC, which is essentially a combination of contrastive representation learning and uh, uh, negative data augmentation. So more concretely, our key intuition is that instead of just the focus on the uh, positive observed sample, we try to explicitly synthesize and introduce some negative samples and tell the model, okay, those samples should be considered as low probability and um, based on our domain knowledge. So, uh, how do we apply this intuition to the uh, motion forecasting problem? So most of the recent uh, forecasting methods uh, follow this kind of encoder-decoder architecture, where the encoder uh, take uh, the uh, sequ uh, uh, sequential observation of everyone in the scene uh, and produce a comp compact representation with respect to one of the agent, for example, uh, this agent I. We hope that uh, this Latin representation is not only uh, captured its own history, but also aware of the others. And then the decoder try to roll out uh, the future trajectory, the dashed line on the right-hand side. Um, and, that, and then we can train this model using standard supervised learning method. But as, as we discussed earlier, so the learned model may not be very robust uh, at test time in the closed loop operation. So what we propose is to reg explicitly regularize uh, this extracted motion represent representation by using an auxiliary self supervised task. So uh, specifically, what we try to do is to uh, establish a contrastive task where the model has to uh, tell if the future events is uh, feasible or not, is safe or not, based on this extracted motion representation. We'll talk about this sampling process in a second, but the key idea is that we can adopt this contrastive representation learning technique, project this, uh, hidden representation as well as the events into a lower dimensional space, and then we compare the similarities. We encourage the extracted motion representation to be similar to the embedding of the positive sample while dissimilar to the rest of the negative ones. One crucial component in this framework is the design of those negative samples. 
So in fact, the contrastive representation learning has achieved a tremendous success in the region and language in the past few years, especially last year. But usually uh, what they do is to draw positive sample from the ground truth data, but the negative them, uh, samples randomly from the data set. And this, uh, this, uh, this sampling method, method is not that suitable for our motion context because uh, in our problem, we, we use contrastive learning as the auxiliary task, uh, whereas we still have the main task uh, uh, that, is, that already try to enforce the understanding of the positive sample. So our key objective is to inform the model about the negative events, which it has to avoid. So uh, because of that, we propose to explicitly draw those negative samples based on the position of the others in the future. So uh, specifically, we can count the we still use the ground truth of the blue guy uh, as the positive sample, but the negative sample as, uh, around the location of the others. Basically, we tell the model, okay, it's not considered as good if uh, the blue guy arrives uh, these red uh, regions uh, in this time because it's gonna cause collisions or discomfort to the others. But combining this, uh, uh, these two ideas, uh, like uh, contrast representation learning and negative data samples, we actually achieved quite impressive results um, uh, experimentally on both the forecasting problem and the robot navigation problem. Uh, on forecasting problem, what we find is that uh, it uh, consistently reduced the collision rates, uh, not only on uh, TrackNet++, but also on the older uh, ETH and UCY benchmark. Uh, so as we, you can see, like the collision rates is always uh, reduced without harming the prediction accuracy. And with respect to the TrackNet++, uh, uh, sorry, let me move this. So here I pick up uh, two particular scenario in the avoidance and the group sub category. So um, what we find uh, qualitatively is that, uh, I don't know, okay, oh, sorry. I think the animation doesn't work well. So basically um, uh, the model trained by the vanilla standard supervised uh, method uh, cause collisions in these two cases, whereas our method is able to jointly adjust the trajectories of different agents and uh, produce more socially plausible solutions. We also validate our method on imitation learning and reinforced learning. On imitation learning, what we find is that our method can greatly improve the performance, especially in the low data regime. Uh, for reinforced learning, our method also accelerates the state-of-art method. Um, um, for example, like uh, in the in a, a popular crowd navigation simulation environment, our method is able to um, achieve a collision-free policy within 2K episodes, whereas uh, the baseline method as well as uh, contrast learning with random negative sampling uh, cannot work well. Um, to conclude, our method uh, uh, called social NCE can greatly improve the robustness of uh, neural motion models. And we achieve state of art in both forecasting problem and uh, planning problem in the multi-agent context. More importantly, we think that uh, this idea uh, maybe a very promising alternative to the uh, classical interactive data documentation for policy learning. And if you're interested in more details, uh, please uh, check out our paper as well, as well as our code available online. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Any questions from the crowd? Maybe we can continue while uh, we ask the next speaker. I mean, if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, uh, Said, I think you're the next uh, speaker. Hello, yes. Please uh, share your, your, your Zoom. The Zoom is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am Said, and uh, I want to present you our work, uh, which is a joint work with my colleagues uh, in Vita Lab. Uh, and this is S attack, socially attended attacks, uh, shed light on trajectory prediction. Uh, yeah, as a as the previous uh, speakers said, uh, we have the trajectory prediction uh, definition, which uh, is basically predicting the uh, 
uh, next few frames of uh, different agents in the scene, uh, given the previous frames. Uh, and we have seen a lot of state-of-the-art models that can work uh, relatively well. But uh, what if a slight perturbation occurs? Uh, can the current models uh, handle them uh, without any safety critical decision? Uh, are they socially aware? You can see, for example, in this scenario that perturbing the trajectories uh, of the echo agent uh, will change the prediction predict the trajectory of that agent in order to, not only the echo agent, but also the target agent in order to avoid the collision. But it's not always the case. And uh, we have seen that uh, perturbing uh, uh, the trajectory prediction can sometimes lead to a collision. Uh, in this work, uh, we studied uh, if, uh, if a small perturbation in the trajectories uh, can lead to a safety critical decision, uh, which is a collision. Uh, our, our, our method uh, is, uh, yeah, yeah yes. uh, basically in our method, we try to find uh, a perturbation sequence in, a, in an adversarial training framework uh, to be added to the main agent. Uh, and then uh, based on the loss function uh, that we define, uh, we try to find the best agent in the best frame. Basically, we will uh, provide the minimum perturbation uh, that is required to, um, to give a collision. And uh, this, this, these are some part of the uh, method that I mentioned here. Uh, as mentioned before, the collision avoidance is our method of uh, being social and uh, we use soft attention uh, to smartly select the potential candidate. Uh, this are uh, the perturbation sequence and also the, uh, the weight for the soft attention uh, are the things uh, that, is, that are learned uh, in our uh, training process. Uh, and uh, the other terms are the regularizers. Uh, if we Look at how the network learns this perturbation during uh, during the attack. Uh, basically, uh, we try to perturb the uh, the ego agent, and uh, based on all the candidates. So, if we want to make a collision, uh, we have a lot of neighbors and we have a lot of time frames. So we have many candidates, but with our approach, uh, we can effectively select. Uh, the best frame in the best, uh, yeah, the best neighbor in the best frame with the minimum perturbation. Uh, and how is it useful then? Uh, so we, we evaluated uh, the, the, the famous um, benchmark, uh, the, the famous uh, state of the art models on different benchmarks, mainly on TrajNet++. And we have seen that uh, the collision rate of uh, the model uh, can uh, increase from 10% to around 80 or more by just a small perturbation of uh, three or four centimeters on average, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. Uh, and for example, you can see here some qualitative results that uh, some famous models uh, can work unexpectedly with, uh, with these adversarial attacks. And uh, how these adversarial uh, attacks are useful uh, in uh, the trajectory predictions, uh, basically we can uh, use, them, uh, use these adversarial examples to improve the robustness of those models. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the baseline model uh, has a collision rate of 7%, uh, but with our approach, basically using these and examples as data augmentations, we can improve the collision rate by 10%. And also the model is less vulnerable to the next attacks. So the, in the attack column, uh, I mean, uh, the model uh, is 60% less vulnerable to new attacks if we, uh, if we try to attack it after uh, robustify. Uh, and then, yeah, this is the model that uh, we submitted uh, to the challenge. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. And if if you want uh, for more information, please visit our webpage. Thank you, Said. Are there questions?